In the last segment, we talked about motion estimation. Um, but there was a little sleight of hand there, and I now need to confess that and fix it. So what was the sleight of hand? Is that when we estimate motion, there is an ambiguity. And let's just make sure we understand what that is. So this, is the, this should look like a familiar picture. This is my pinhole camera down here. There's the aperture. There's the sensor back here. And then we have the world out here. And what is motion estimation? You have something at time t equals 1, and it moves in the world to another position. And then both of those get projected into the image. And I want to estimate that as the motion. So that little vector there is the 1D version of motion estimation. And so what was the sleight of hand is I told you we were estimating motion, but I didn't tell you where the motion was explicitly. And where it is, is in the image, but not necessarily in the world. Now, obviously, motion in the image corresponds to some motion in the world, but what motion? So for example, in this little picture here, am I looking at something that is far from me and moving fast? Or am I looking at something that is close to me and moving slowly? So look at this picture over here. This motion out in the world that is far and fast is very similar. In fact, it's exactly the same as this motion here that is slow and close because they both project to the same point. In fact, this looks very familiar because this is the perspective projection ambiguity. When you project things from the world into the image, there is an ambiguity along the ray of projection. So when now we, we move into the temporal domain, I have two rays, time one, time two. And so something that is far and fast and something that is slow and close look exactly the same to me. Now, for estimating motion in the image, maybe you don't care, but let's say I'm in a self-driving car and I, the difference, let's agree, that something that is far and fast and slow and close is pretty big. And we can't tell the difference of those things from only the single static motion because we're simply estimating motion in an image. And I think we can agree that there is a difference here, a very practical difference for how you're going to respond to something moving fast or something moving slowly. And so now we need, need to start thinking about how to eliminate this ambiguity. Okay, again, this is the same ambiguity we saw before in a static image. If I have something that is far and large and something that is small and close, they will get imaged exactly the same. There is an inherent ambiguity in perspective projection when you slam the three-dimensional world into a two-dimensional sensor, we lose information. Okay. So what can we do about that? Well, um, we, the human being, have resolved this ambiguity with two eyes. We don't just see uh, cyclopean, we see from the left eye and the right eye. And that allows us to resolve some of the ambiguity. How? Well, let's think about this far and big and close and small ambiguity, and then we'll get to the motion example in a little bit. So let's imagine, let's just look at this one camera here. Here's the ambiguity. Both of these objects image to the exactly the same point on the sensor. Yeah, But now it's, let's imagine I'm looking at the world from a slightly different perspective. Think of these two cameras as my left and my right eye. Well then, the object that is far away gets imaged at a different location than the object that is nearby. This is what my two eyes give me. So, and you can do this, by the way. Um, the best way to do this is hold your thumb in front of you and close one eye and then flip the eye uh, to the other one. Go back and forth, back and forth, and your thumb will move quite a bit. But now focus on something in the distance and it won't move as much. That's because when something is close, it images to quite distinct locations in the eye, and as you go further and further and further away, it uh, images to roughly the same location. This is called the uh, stereo imaging. We look at the world from two positions. By the way, here's a little observation in case you haven't noticed. Uh, predators, humans, tigers, lions, have stereo vision. They have two eyes in front of their head. Why? Because they have to triangulate. When they are chasing a gazelle, chasing a prey, they need to be able to tell how far it is. Is it something that is fast and far from me or something slow and near? Is it something big and far or something small and near? And it has stereo vision. Prey 
doesn't have stereo vision. Deers do what? They have eyes on the sides of their head, bunny rabbits on the sides of their heads. Why? Because they just need to stick their face into the ground and eat grass. And, but they need to know who's behind them. And so they have essentially eyes behind their head so they can see the predator coming to catch them. And so stereo vision has evolved to give us this notion of depth and to be able to triangulate and remove the ambiguity that resolves from only a single view of the world, the inherent ambiguity. So this type of stereo vision is pretty common on self-driving cars. It's common on robotics. It's actually common on iPhones now. We have two cameras that allow us to infer at least a little bit of depth to help with some of the imaging. And we're gonna talk now a little bit about this because it helps resolve some of the ambiguities that resolves in motion estimation, fast and far, slow and near, and it resolves some of the ambiguity from perspective projection. All right. So let's see how this is going to work. Now, Everything's gonna work exactly the same thing. I'm gonna go back to the pinhole model because whether it's a lens or a pinhole is not gonna matter very much. I've got my two cameras over here um, that I'm going to image from. And um, I've got some object out in the world. And again, it images to one camera here and to the other camera here. And the question is, based on these two locations of the same object, can I infer depth, okay? Um, so what is what can I measure is that difference right there. So I'm measuring the difference between where it imaged in the first camera, dead center, because I've drawn that in a convenient location, and it imaged over here, and I want to know how big is that, and I want to know what is the relationship between that gap right there and how far something is. I hope you see your triangles. You know the triangles are your friend when we're trying to do some kind of geometric reconstruction. And I see a couple of triangles here. Uh, let me label a few things on those triangles. So my camera focal length is F. That's the distance between the aperture and this pinhole camera and the sensor. The separation between my camera is B, the baseline. So that's the distance between the two apertures. And my object is a distance Z from the camera, which is this right here. So here's one triangle um, that is B, the baseline, and Z. And then I have another triangle that is what? It's the focal length, and then the thing I care about, the D, which I'm gonna call disparity, how much something moved between eye left and then the right eye. And notice I have two triangles now that look an awful lot like similar triangles. So let me go ahead and just draw that triangle. So I have one triangle that has a height Z and a base B. I have another triangle that has a height F in a base D, and what do I know? I, let's say I put the cameras out in the world so I know the baseline. I know the camera length, the, the focal length, I have F. And I also am going to measure D. How? We'll get back to that in a little bit. And I wanna estimate Z from those three values. Beautiful, I have similar triangles. F over D is equal to Z over B, my two similar triangles. And if I wanna estimate how far something is, it's FB over D, just cross multiply. So let's see what's happening here. So Z is equal to, proportional to F and B, and then inversely proportional to the disparity. Let's make sure we understand that inverse proportionality. So what that means is as Z gets bigger, goes further and further away from me, what happens to the disparity? It gets smaller. Sure, we just saw that in the previous slide. As I start to slide Z away, what happens to this thing? It starts to get more and more similar to the previous one, and eventually when I get to infinity, everything maps to the same point. So things that are far away will have a small disparity. Things that are close will have a large disparity. That's my thumb exercise. Switch your eyes left and right. Lots of motions because you're nearby. That's the disparity between the left and right eye. Whereas things far away have very little disparity because they're not moving as much. And now the question is just, how do we estimate disparity? We assume we know the camera focal length. We know that the cameras are uh, translated uh, B. And if I can estimate that disparity, well, I've resolved my ambiguity. I know how far something is from me, depth imaging or stereo imaging. So let me give you an example of this. This is frame one of, uh, sorry, left eye of uh, a view of the motorcycle in the garage, and this is the right eye. And I'm gonna switch back and forth and just look at different parts of the image and see what's going on. So left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye. 
And what you should notice is that things that are closer to me, like the motorcycle uh, uh, tire, are moving more than things that are in the background, like that bench. And in fact, if I superimpose the left eye and the right eye, and I'm gonna just draw a little yellow arrow between matching features uh, on the background, the bench, and the foreground, the kickstand of the motorcycle, you notice that that disparity, how much it moved, is more um, for things that are close to me than things are for farther away. By the way, this is sounding a lot like motion estimation. What did I just say? Something moved more that it's closer to me than further away. Now, obviously, nothing actually moved. It's just that I, my, well, my camera moved, but the, uh, the world didn't move. But it's sort of the same thing, right? If I sit with one eye right here and I move like this, that's the same as if the world did the same motion. There's no difference from, from what the, the frame of reference is. And so you can think about stereo imaging in exactly the same way we thought of motion estimation, it's just what's moving. In this case, it's the camera with a static scene versus a static camera and a moving world. But the problem is exactly the same. And that's sort of nice, because that means all the techniques that we've developed for motion estimation work for stereo estimation. And so what we're gonna eventually do, and let me just give you an intuition for what this looked like, is for every pixel in that image, we're basically gonna estimate motion. How much did something move from point one to point two? And then that's gonna be the disparity. If I know the focal length and the baseline, I can estimate Z. So here I'm just plotting for you the disparity um, color-coded. So yellow is a big disparity close to me. And as I move through greens and through the blue, it gets further away from me. So you can see the ground is close, the tire and the motorcycle are close, and then everything starts receding further away from me because the amount it moves or it's imaged into different locations is uh, decreasing as it goes further away from me. And notice that that plot gives me a lot of information. It gives me how far something is from me. So things like obstacle avoidance. I'm a robot moving through the world. I absolutely wanna know if that's something big and far or small and close. Otherwise, how am I going to avoid it? If I wanna know what the shape of something is, knowing 3D is really useful. And so now what we have to do is figure out, well, how do we do those estimates? But I've already hinted at it because stereo matching, computing disparity, and motion estimation, computing how much something moved in the world relative to the camera, are basically the same problem. You're asking where is something at time one and time two versus where is something in the left eye and the right eye? And the underlying techniques are gonna turn out to be the same. And when we come back, we'll go ahead and take a look at that.